it's, it's great to be speaking with you. And I know we're on a bit of limited time, so I'll, I'll quickly run through what I, I aim to cover. First of all, a bit of scene setting in the tourism sector. We'll look at the development of photography and tourism. Next, some of the considerations uh, on the social side, such as emotions and influence. Then some techn technological developments. And finally, some of the implications for tourism and marketing organizations. So first, a bit of scene setting. A, a key consideration in the, uh, is that hospitality and tourism products could be seen as high risk, high involvement purchases. And the decision making process involves emotional risk. Have I made the right choice? Should we have gone somewhere else? Will I feel good about saying to others that I have been to X, Y, Z place? or as maybe more likely today, via social media, say that I'm already in X, Y, Z place, with the ability for my friends to give me feedback straight away. It's therefore been proposed that reference group evaluation is important in mitigating this risk. This is supported by the work of Maboy and Torchio, and also Litvin, who note that word of mouth is an important driver of business, and that interpersonal communication has for a long time had a strong influence in the tourism and travel industry. Looking specifically at the bed and breakfast accommodation market as an example, word of mouth has been identified as the most popular way for a guest to become aware of a particular property, while the website will be used for more detailed research. Work by Hudson and Gilbert in respect of the Canadian market may be of interest to you. Now Web2 and social media has created electronic word of mouth resulting in increased speed and breadth of distribution, creating different challenges and opportunities for those carrying out marketing activity in the travel and tourism sector. And LinkedIn proposes that as more and more travelers are tapping into this collective intelligence on the internet, this will challenge the established marketing practices of many tourism businesses and destinations. Zhang and Gretzel go even further and propose that tourism marketers can't ignore the role of social media in distributing travel-related information without becoming irrelevant. <coughs> Looking now more specifically at imagery and the development of photography and tourism, images have been and continue to be a key factor in the promotion of travel and tourism. In fact, Larson proposes that, in the, that the early history of photography is intimately linked to travel and tourism. Photography was previously a specialist commercial activity, but with tourists desiring photography, it became designed with the tourist in mind and later for traveling light. What in effect was the birth of the Kodak roll fill camera, which Manier and Phillips note made photography part of everyday life. Moving forward, digital point and shoot cameras are now the victims of mobile phones, with Mintel reporting that digital camera sales in the UK fell 27% between 2007 and 2011. They also report that 34% of camera owners want to upload content directly to social networks. Mobile phones go hand in hand with Web2, which allows sharing of content with potentially millions of users. So you can see why this has opened up new opportunities for tourism organizations. This is supported by Hannah et al, who highlight that with increased customer connectivity, Content goes hand in hand with technology, impacting the way marketers influence current and potential customers. Consider also Garrod's view that the practice of photography is often related to being a tourist. And this is supported by Uri, who in his tourist gaze model, proposes a relationship between tourism as a production system and photography as a tourist practice. And that, and that strategy is a that travel, sorry, is a strategy to gaze on while acquiring photographs of panoramas, landscapes, and other manifestations that they have been led to expect to find there via exposure to visual representations in tourism adverts, brochures, and travel books, etc. Halrup and Larson, on the other hand, take a view that tourist photography revolves around social relations rather than consuming places. And they're supported by Groves and Timothy, who propose that photographs provide an opportunity to share experiences with others. What might be important here is that there is a gap of around 10 years between the initial work of Uri and that of Haldrup and Larson, which potentially raises the questions, 
what are the motivations to take photographs? And have they been influenced by advances in technology? More on that later. But there does appear to be a need to explore further why tourists take and share photographs and any variances across different demographic groups. It might be worth thinking briefly of the Kodak advert of the 1920s, which said, don't let sites like these run like water through your fingers. Catch them with a the Kodak so that on dry and dusty days, you may drink again. We can also reference the work by Lowe et al, which includes comment that Kodak could be thought to have facilitated the decline of the traveler and the rise of the tourist having transformed photography to a more superficial activity. Turning now to some of the social factors, emotions and influence, for example, at a social level, tourism has been said to exist in the interplay between places and stories, and that by transforming an intangible experience into something tangible, photographs enable tourists to take ownership of these experiences and measure them. What can be important from the point of view of the destination marketing organization is that, and as noted by McInnes and Yavorsky, mental images have the potential to be more personally relevant because they are anchored in the person's experience base and generated by his or her own mental processes. With strong relevance being a desirable facet of persuasive communications, this is of interest and importance to destination marketing organizations. Hassani and Gilbert note that for the holidaymaker, the tourism experience is of high personal value and is accompanied with satisfying and pleasurable emotions. Again, what can be considered important to a destination marketing organization is that emotional reactions to the tourism experience are fundamental determinants of post-consumption experience, including intention to recommend. Of course, it's noted that with the smartphone, the tourist has the capability to take action to recommend or share experiences in many instances real time, or at least much more quickly and widely than was the case previously. In addition, Goosen has highlighted that experiential processes such as imaging, daydreams and emotions play an important role in destination choice behavior. We can also consider the work of Lo et al in that travel photography plays a multitude of roles in tourism. At a more simple level, it verifies that a person physically visited the place and provides evidence that the individual has experienced some form of authentic, exotic other life. But photographs also play a much deeper symbolic role in helping to construct travel memories. And what about technology? Well, it's proposed by Berthon et al. that Web2 technologies have caused three effects. First, a move from desktop-based activity to the web. Second, value production has moved from the business to the consumer. And thirdly, power has moved from the business to the consumer. This has allowed creative consumers to flourish, and this is they, rather than companies or organizations, who are now at the center of design, collaboration, and community of the internet. It is evident then that the advances in technology in the form of smartphones and increased connectivity are giving destination marketing organizations much to think about as the power balance moves further away from a one-way push communication where the destination has all but complete control over the message and the media to an increasing position of consumer power where new platforms are coming along, changes are taking place within existing ones, and the demographic profiles of who is using what seems to change as well. And of course, with the smartphone comes the selfie. So what about the issues facing destination marketing organizations as a result of the sharing of imagery? What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? And how are they reacting to it? Specifically, how are they reacting to selfies? There are a number of areas that have been highlighted as needing further attention. Web2 and user-generated content is changing fundamentally the travel search and destination selection process. And destination marketing organizations need to consider the implications of this. Rossiter proposes that advertising strategists should be especially interested in the operation and consequences of imagery as a means of influencing consumers. Linked to this is a view from Akehurst and others who believe that Web2 media are seen by some tourists as more credible than traditional marketing communications. The impact of this in the context of tourist gener generated imagery in general is important. 
Also, Bassani and Gilbert highlight that the overall tourism experience is rich in terms of emotions, and tourists are actively involved in the production of their own experiences. An understanding of how tourists react to or benefit from their emotional experiences will enable the formulation of appropriate marketing strategies. They therefore propose that tourism providers should strive to engineer positive emotions to create enjoyable and memorable experiences. Hassari and Gilbert also propose that destination marketing organisations have been under pressure to understand and recognise the experiential qualities of their tourism offerings. Tourist emotional experiences play an important role in, in influencing satisfaction levels and intention to recommend, as we noted a short while ago. Lowetal proposed that traditionally travel photo sharing was largely a private endeavour with small audiences and a verbal narrative accompanying the presentation to provide some context. Web2 has transformed this into something that is largely in the public domain and has expanded the potential audience beyond traditional family and friends to new, geographically dispersed networks of strangers. In addition, Web2 has enabled the aggregation of information from a huge array of disparate sources and enables an unlimited number of individuals to potentially join virtual networks and gain valuable market intelligence online. They also propose that people who post images online also tend to search for travel information from others who engage in similar activities. And what about the, market, the destination marketing organisation in the middle of all of this? Do they see it as free marketing? Does it help increase awareness, reach and engagement? Does it tell them things about their destination to inform future development activity? What are we doing well? What are we doing not so well? Does it help them to gauge sentiment or create online communities? And what about the other side of the coin? Do they feel they are suffering from a loss of control over brand or message? Have they got the resources, the budget, the time, the skills to keep on top of the proliferation of images being shared online? And what do they think about selfies and amongst all this? Well, before we look at some of these things, I thought it might be worth sharing with you some of the media coverage on selfies and tourism. As you might expect, it's a, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Take first of all the headline from August last year in the Mirror newspaper website, Selfies Banned on French Beach as Social Media is Flooded with Holiday Spam. Unreferenced research in the article quotes that one in three Brits now puts bragging in their top five vacation activities with the beach being the most common backdrop for their photos. Two sections of the beach have been designated no braggy zones for the two weeks during the peak holiday rush in August. The beach authorities have worked with Mobile Phone Network 3 to impose the ban and the firm has apologised for the increase in holiday spam after it decided to scrap data roaming fees in 16 international destinations. And the marketing director of the company is quoted as saying the ban is an extreme measure, but one we think is needed if we're to motivate people to brag more responsibly. I have to say I'm not sure what brag more responsibly means, but anyway, <laughs> I go responsibly abroad and share only the finest photos of the holidays on social media. I guess this raises questions about bragging. Has, has it always been there? And is it just that advances in technology have made it more prevalent? Or perhaps just more obvious? <coughs> and what about the scourge of the selfie stick? or the wand of narcissism as reported on ABC in Australia, with the reporter wondering why tourists find their faces more fascinating than the wonders they behold. This takes us back to the perhaps conflicting views on the relationship between tourism and photography and the motivations behind photography. This article refers to the National Gallery of Australia lifting its ban on selfies, which it proposes is a relief to the many patrons who previously prevented from taking a selfie in front of an important artwork, in fear their Facebook friends may not have believed they had actually been there. And it begs the question, will the selfie in front of the self-portrait take precedence over the viewing of the actual self-portrait? And it goes on, what is it about the selfie that makes it so critical to so many, especially tourists? Is it too proof that they've been there? Would family and friends not believe that they'd been to the Grand Canyon or the Great Wall of China unless their squinting face was front and centre of Facebook? Mm -hmm. Have we become a society where a validation of the experience is in the form of the selfie? It finishes with, 
I don't travel to see myself. I travel to see other cultures and sights. If I want to know what I look like, I resort to that well-known invention, the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Some interesting questions there relating to the motivation to share tourism imagery and how have these changed or been shaped by not only the means of taking them in the form of the smartphone, but also the ability to share to many people in real time instead of showing your snaps to a few friends after you, you get home. Here's another example from City Press in uh, South Africa. On a trip to one of the world's most beautiful cities, Istanbul, the journalist found herself surrounded by tourists engaging in what she describes as one of this generation's less attractive habits, yes. relentless snapping of selfies. Mm -hmm. And it goes on. On a three-day trip to Turkey this month, I experienced an existential crisis about the true narcissistic mess that tourism has become. Strong words indeed. I started wondering whether traveling has become more about taking as many photos with your face in them than actually learning about the place you're at, taking it in and absorbing as much knowledge as you can. It's a kind of vanity tourism, where visiting famous sites is like collecting Pokemon cards for your deck. <laughs> It's not about any real interest in the site, but more about being able to say you've been there and have a photo with your face in it to prove. To prove it, again, is that the motivating factor, proof of attendance? She goes on, there's nothing wrong with wanting proof that you were somewhere important. Nothing wrong with a pic here and a pout there, but along the way, be sure to take in the place around you. The tapestry you'll build in your mind, the remembrance of the smells, the heat and the people, will one day mean much more and feel far more sacred than those Facebook likes ever could. <laughs> there are parallels here with the work of crime in relation to seeing how touristic sightseeing is shaped and his reference to Albers and James' analysis of exploring the representations of people and places found in American postcards and how this sets up expectations or frames what will be seen and that the visited sites are measured against the prior expectations set up through their depictions. <coughs> and also that a structure of expectation is created where the pictures circulating around sites are more important than the sites themselves. They propose that it has created a kind of alienation which has become a hallmark of photographic seeing in tourism. The signs that mark out what is to be looked at become as or more important than the sites themselves. It is the markers that create the experience rather than any authentic engagement with the landscape. Interesting to note that Albers and James' work dates back to 1988, long before web, web 2, smartphones and selfies. Note also the reference at the start of this piece to uh, this generation. Maybe there's just an element of, uh, dare I say, that some of us with a certain quantity of um, grey hair just don't like what these pesky youngsters are doing. Who knows? <laughs> then there are sad instances. Couple dies taking selfie on edge of cliff. A couple visiting Portugal plunge to their deaths while trying to snap a selfie with their kids on the edge of a beachside cliff. Portuguese authorities are investigating the incident but believe the deaths were directly caused by what New York Post refers to as the killer selfie. <laughs> <laughs> on the other side of the coin, there are destinations that seem to embrace the selfie. The website Berlin Getaway has published an article entitled Berlin's Best Place for a Selfie and lists five iconic locations, including the Brandenburg Gate. It concludes, whether you're looking for an instantly recognizable image or something more unique, excite some Twitter admiration with these five unforgettable shots. Again, interesting that the emphasis appears to be on impressing your Twitter followers as, as opposed to savoring the places and recording your experiences for your own future consumption. This is continued to some extent by a blog on the Auto Europe website with an article entitled, Taking the Perfect Selfie. It proposes that the selfie has emerged as a modern day art form. It says people take selfies while skydiving, while doing crazy stunts, and even while driving. Although it does recommend this last one uh, isn't one that should be carried out. It proposes that vacations are one of the best places to take selfies with the comment that here at Auto Europe, we believe that anything worth doing is worth doing right, and goes on to give its top tips. It finishes with, the skills required to take the perfect selfie can be applied to this modern day art form at home or abroad. But here at Auto Europe, 
we believe that taking a little extra time to prepare before you hit the road is worth the effort and will guarantee that your friends and family back home are duly impressed. Mm. Duly impressed. Impressing others and bragging. Is that what it's all about? Some future research, I, I think. Mm. <coughs> so we can pick up on some more of the work by crying when he says, we have begun to confuse our subjectivity with its image endlessly played back on video monitors which proliferate in our lives. The moment is no longer, if it ever could have been, lived for itself. Photography seizes and freezes a present moment for a future audience, separated in time and space. While space remain, may, may remain true, time may be less in the future, given the advances in technology and the ability to share real time. And again, the employment of photography to tell a story about yourself, distending the moment of experience both by prefiguring the scene and turning it into a souvenir for the future. Consider also Haldrup and Larson when they say, as a ritual of the domestic cult, families use the camera to display success, unity and love. It is put to work to immortalise and celebrate the high points of family life. This was written in 2003. Compare it to the press articles bemoaning the bragging and self-centred photo takers of today and consider what has been technology's role in this. So back to destination marketing organisations. What is the impact here? Well, as noted by Lowe et al, traditionally, destination management organisations and private sector businesses controlled the formation and dissemination of a desired destination image. But as Aikers proposes, the yeah. advent of a range of online photo sharing media has, has democratised the image creation and dissemination process, whereby DMOs and industry now compete with a wide range of non-commercial materials posted by tourists, to the extent that, the, that these information providers are now felt to exert a significant influence on the tourist decision-making behaviour. While I'm at the early stages of my own research, I think it's fair to say that DMOs recognise the importance of the changing nature of imagery in tourism. There are a number of challenges in terms of time, budget, how they monitor and listen to gauge sentiment, and do they have the skills and resources to do this? Loss of control may be a consideration. However, it appears to be a view that tourist imagery is viewed as an enhancement to destination marketing. This appears to be based on a situation where, currently certainly, DMOs are not experiencing any great quantity of negative image sharing, and that imagery in general is of a positive nature. We can perhaps link this to the earlier reference to Hassani and Gilbert when they say that the tourism experience is of high personal value and is accompanied with satisfying and pleasurable emotions. Looking at the opportunities, these can include increased awareness, opportunities for engagement, the creation of quality online communities, and the identification of key influencers. Again, Lo et al. reference work by Pan, McCordon and Cross, who note, key informants have visited the destination, but do not have any obligation to promote it. Many Thank users see this as a more reliable and unbiased than materials posted by some DMOs. And what specifically about selfies? Well, this appears to be stimulating mixed responses. Quality of the photography is an issue. And while some DMOs may engage with the taker of the selfie to build or maintain a relationship, they may not feel the need to share it or feel that they can share it. And while some DMOs view selfies as very much of the moment, there are instances of others actively seeking to encourage selfie takers to send in their images as part of promotional activity. A key challenge may be the ability to attach some sort of commercial value to tourist imagery and how to go about doing that and report on it to stakeholders in a meaningful way. In summary, the sharing of tourist imagery and selfies is giving DMOs plenty to think about, and we appear to be in the early days of fully understanding it and how it will shape DMO strategy and reporting. To conclude, where does it leave selfies? Well, it can be seen from the very media coverage we referenced earlier. Perhaps for the time being, it can be considered to be the love it or hate it marmite of the tourism sector. <laughs> that was great, David. Thank you so much. Um, yeah.
have uh, students come up here individually to ask you a couple questions. They're going right. to do exactly what I'm doing, come right up to you, and then uh, I'll have them step away and you can answer to the class. Does that sound good? As best I can, yeah. Uh, that was fabulous, I wanted to say. You raised a whole bunch of really um, interesting themes that we discussed in class today because we were talking about uh, Marxism and his, uh, historical materialism and a lot of the themes that came out of um, the topic you addressed today, we can directly relate to, to some of these overarching sort of cultural theory themes. So I'm going to pass it over to the students and then uh, and we'll start the dialogue back and forth. Okay. Um, my question was, how does commercial photography influence, influence tourist photographic behavior? Um, in the journalism or the Journal of Tourism Consumption, um, Larson uh, was doing research on that, so I was just wondering if there was an influence or not. Yeah, I think I think the the public is again picking up on something we we just covered earlier. There, the the fact that um, some of the commercial photography is uh, maybe setting the expectation in terms of what the tourists also want to go and um, go and photograph. Uh, you know some of the iconic, you know, the, the Taj Mahal or the, the, the Grand Canyon, etc. You know, and uh, have, have the tourism organisations. You know, they've they've taken staged shots of these, if you like, commercially they employed somebody commercially to take photographs of these. And as I say, as, as we covered a short while ago, that is, is that then stimulating some of the some of the photography that's um, that's that's taking place with with tourists. I think something else actually, which which is linked to this slightly, is the fact that. And um, in amongst the, the proliferation of, of tourist imagery that, that is maybe getting sent into um, to the destination marketing organizations, there's also an element of semi-professional stroke professional photographers also sending in their own imagery to the destination marketing organizations. Potentially, one wonders with a view of, you know, is it giving them exposure and does it also help their businesses to flourish as well? Mm -hmm. Does that, does that answer the question? Absolutely, that's great. That's great. Okay, just a minute. Uh, so you spoke earlier about uh, tourist-generated imagery. So I was just wondering, like, in relation to, say, an accommodation website, do you think people are more likely to trust uh, personal pictures that people have uploaded or the pictures that were put up by the site? And um, again, I say what's what's coming out of some of the reading um, is is that the the tourist imagery is is potentially um, uh, viewed as being more reliable. Um, again, interesting. There's 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 maybe a slight difference between um, the destination marketing organisation, which is is um, you know marketing the, the the region or the city, and actually at the end of the day doesn't have a sale to make, it, it's, it's, it's the product providers, it's the, it's the hotel, it's the bed and breakfast, the attractions, etc. cetera. Um, so the, there's, there's maybe a slight difference there in terms of, of, of um, the, the, the level of attachment to reliability between tourism image, imagery in, in respect to the actual products being delivered and, and what the product providers are saying, and maybe a slightly different balance with the actual destination itself. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, we were we were talking about this last week with the group. Um, you know, when we were trying to attach it to our personal experience of go of going to a website and seeing the professional shots inside a hotel room, and then seeing the um, the amateur shots and comparing them and having this very sort of you know. Um, I, think, I think one of the yeah. things that's coming out is that the, um, the 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 destination or product provider has to has to live up to the expectation being set by the imagery. Because because there is now this two way communication that the the, the the purchaser of the product or the person who's experiencing the destination has the platform to come back and go well your pictures gave me the the expectation of this mm -hmm. but when I actually got there I experienced something different so there has to be a, a very uh, a much more sharp if you like match between what's being said and what the destination is actually delivering <coughs> and accountability yeah yeah. I'm just going to bring another student up here. Hey, David. Uh, since I'm too scared to like talk in front of the class, or, <laughs> I'm too scared to ask for anyone to take a picture of me. I was wondering if we can take a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah. 
Let me get closer, yeah. Very yeah. meta going on here. <laughs> there we go. Um, right. Anyways, uh, I'm a selfie tourist myself, and I've been traveling alone uh, in Europe for four months. And do you think people take selfies in front of uh, significant spots due to the fact that people want to have uh, these pictures but are too scared to ask for someone to take a picture of them? Oh, interesting. Great. Uh, it's, it's an interesting question, actually, and, and, and slightly off at a, at a tangent, but, but something I read was, was that um, uh, being able to take selfies means you don't have to run the risk of giving your phone or camera to somebody else when they might they might actually steal it and run off with it. <laughs> um, so, uh, whether that's that's anything to do with it, um, I'm, I'm 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 not sure uh, to be honest. Yeah. It is interesting to think about though, like um, it, that perhaps it's also an element of control, right? To be able to not just um, control and frame the. The, the image and the place that you're taking it, the, the picture of, but to control and frame the presentation of yourself, the performance yeah. of yourself in this place too, right? Yeah. So the control yeah. kind of aspect is interesting as well that you brought up earlier. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Uh, David, it's me again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, was really, yeah. Yeah, I was really intrigued by this topic, but um, I was wondering if you uh, have looked at any statistics uh, based on uh, selfies and tourism, and if so, uh, how did you find them? I I haven't actually looked specifically um, at the, the the tourist element of this. Um, when I was first looking at my research proposal, um, I was potentially looking at coming at this from two angles. One was to try and carry out some research with with tourists to find out. Uh, you know, reasons for taking photographs, reasons for sharing with platforms, etc., and and do some some more in depth stuff there, with a view to that potentially informing some of the research on uh, the impact that it's having on destination marketing organisations. It was then developing into something that was going to be far too big for me to cover within a a, a master's dissertation. So I, I focused in on the on the destination marketing organisation element of it. But I, I I do think there is. There is work to be done there. Having said that, just recently, in the last couple of days, I've, I've come across some papers which may actually address some of the things you're looking for. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to get my hands on them yet, so I, I can't unfortunately answer your question. But it's it's, it's certainly an area to be looked at. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. If you ever come across them, I can forward them on to, to Austin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hiya. Uh, my question was, while I was reading The Family Gaze, I kind of noticed how it touches upon how photography and tourism are almost codependent in certain aspects. And I was wondering if you thought that uh, tourism would be able to flourish as much as it has in the age of technology if, um, if photography weren't around. Great question. Uh, yes, that's a very, it's a very good question. And I think, I think it ties back into... Um, I, I'm assuming you're asking specifically in the context of, of tourist imagery and, and, and selfies. Um, and, and I think it ties into some of the things we're looking at in terms of, of how, do the, how do the DMOs see this? You know, do, do they view this as free marketing? And I, and I think the answer to the question is that, that if, if it, it's, it's helping to, to increase awareness, reach, engagement, these types of things, then there's maybe an assumption that it, untested perhaps, that it, that it is helping to, to, uh, to increase tourism and potentially helping the destination marketing organizations and others who may be suffering from, from budget restrictions at the moment as well. Um, there's a bit of a theme coming out that your know, money is not, is not a plenty in some of these organizations and you know, tourist imagery is potentially helping them promote their destination. <laughs> Hi, I was wondering if there are any age um, differences in age and the amount of selfies and photos that are posted online and shared with people, like how many people actually take that amount of photos depending on their age. Hmm. Yeah, um, again, I don't have the data on that. It, it sort of ties in with one of the earlier questions and, and specifically looking at the, um, the, the, the tourist side of the equation. Um, you know, I, I guess there's anecdotal, if you like, that it, 
belief maybe that younger people take more selfies than older people. I, I haven't got the stats to, to prove or disprove that, unfortunately. Um, and then I just have one more. Yeah. Um, do you yourself have any theories on why you think people are so intent on taking the perfect selfie and sharing it with everyone? Like, do you think there's any elements of narcissism or anything like that? I mean, having, having read a variety of papers on it, and again, having read some of the, the, the media coverage that we, that we addressed earlier, that, that, that message is, is, is coming out. Um, whether it's fair or not is, is, is maybe something else to be, uh, to be looked at. And, and again, even in a wider context of you know, why do people post anything on, on Facebook or Twitter, you know, what, what's, what's the motivation there? And, and there may be a, a wide variety, I think, of reasons as to why various people, and again, maybe various age groups, use, use social media, you know, what they use it for. Um, you know, looking at my own Facebook feed every day, you, 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 you see people commenting on things and question what, what, why you've written that, why have you said that? And, and it's, it's, it's difficult, I think, to, to come to a conclusion sometimes on that. Yeah. Um, no, I, I appreciate it in your, um, in, in your lecture how you listed a whole bunch of these potential um, reasons for people taking these images, right? Like um, I broke down uh, the, the ability to be sort of like a micro marketer, right? And in terms of the selfie research, there's been lots of stuff written about this sort of like micro celebrity, right? This idea of sort of being um, a broad, like a micro broadcaster. Um, uh, this, the post being a, a, a tourist photographer as social capital, as evidence, as, as archive, um, the symbolic quality of the memory. Um, I was thinking about, you know, it's tourism is a really interesting kind of phenomena in terms of how photography works, because even though it's a very experiential and material phenomena, you're in a place, you know, you, you have this very sort of like sensory and experiential, um, it, it, uh, you know, experience there, it's also extremely fleeting, right? Yeah. So you're in this place, embodied in this place, but um, you know it's gonna be very short term. And so this idea that you got into of um, uh, like the desire to own it in some regard and that the photo sort of becomes that way to own it, right? Yeah. Um, I was recently in Berlin and uh, you know, looking at all the, the, uh, the tourist shops and one of the big things that caught my eye was owning the piece of the Berlin Wall, like little pieces of the Berlin Wall. And I was thinking about that as well as a sort of like um, the, the desire to own a material quality of this, this memory, right? So the memory as a material object. And um, yeah, did you have some thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's, um, uh, you know, as you say, ownership, you've, you've, you've been there, you've experienced it, you've got a record of it. Um, and, and maybe that touches on a number of these things. You know, one is, one is the proof that you were there. Um, one is the, the ownership, you know, you, you, you've, you've, you've got some relationship with it because you've, you've experienced it. Um, I, I think there's also something else though in terms of, of as you say, that it's, it's the, the actual experience itself is fleeting, but I mean, I, I, you know, came, came across some photos, not selfies I used to have, but there the, the were photographs of a holiday that my wife and I were on uh, over two years ago now. And, and, and that just sparked, you know, memories and, and, and actually I was exchanging comments about it on Facebook with, with somebody that we met on, on holiday, you know, and, and of course, you know, that's something that happened two years ago. And, and, and it just, you know, there is, there is yes, the ownership, but there's, there's, there's just a, a kind of database of, of thought in there, if you like, that, that maybe actually, I would, something just triggered it, you know, I think it was just looking at my, my computer for a file and, and came across the photos file and just and looked at it and, and you know, it's, it's, it's there as a record, but, yeah. but also brings back, you know, positive, warm memories, do you remember that, do you remember that, you know, and, and, and um, there's, there's that element to it as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's sort of like the 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 when you know, the fleetingness isn't so much the experience because obviously the memories are that much that very much like impacting, but yeah. um, the materiality is it's fleeting. So that ownership. Yeah, and I think I think something else in terms of the 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 sort of longevity of the photograph, if you like, or the, the image is is, I, I, I think this is maybe quite a difficult thing to 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 get a grip on, but it, it's if. If the destination marketing organizations view that people sharing images are, 
are positive and, and helps them with their, with their marketing efforts. Um, you know, there are people posting images all the time. So is it, you know, does, does each image only just have a very, very small lifespan? But it's, it's the collective effect of if people are constantly posting images about that place, is that actually what helps drive the awareness, et cetera? And, and what's the lifespan of an image on Facebook, for example? Um, and is, this, is there a need for the, the, the organizations to, to keep posting different images or maybe different images of the same location? <laughs> Yeah, a constant stream of, of images appearing to keep it to keep it top of mind. Um, so again, I, I don't the answer to these. These are just questions that come up as you start looking at this at this field. You know, it's just it's just a, there's such a wide array of things to look at. Yeah, absolutely. No, I was thinking the same thing as you were going through. Um, you know, all of these sort of different inroads into the topic, right? And yeah. you talked about the materiality, why people do it, the tourist sort of perspective, what the destination marketers are going to be doing mm -hmm. with it. Uh, with images um you mentioned and i thought this was interesting that it could be you know financially very beneficial to the destination marketers because if the quality of the images is to uh to a measure that they can in fact just use these images to market yeah. them and talk about a massive benefit to them right yeah. and also yeah. the added quality of authenticity which i thought was kind of interesting which yeah, is and I think, and I think again, it, it was quite interesting that they, they, they certainly don't perceive it as a negative at the moment. Certainly, the ones I've spoken to, it's, it's, it's viewed much, and, and I think, again, maybe linked into the fact that they're not providing the end product, therefore they're maybe not so likely to be hit with, you know, somebody's hotel room wasn't that great, or somebody's meal wasn't that great. That image or complaints more likely to go back to the product provider, not the destination marketing organization. So they, they didn't view it as a, as a threat or, or a loss of control to really any great degree. I think purely because the current experience is that they're getting positive images through. Um, so that, you know, it's not causing them any, any, any difficult, it would appear at the moment. Um, I think in some instances, it's potentially leading them to question um, not quite what the role is, maybe in some instances what the purpose of the website is, in, in, in days gone by, some of them will have been taking bookings on their websites, linking into other platforms. Places like you know websites like Booking.com have come along and, and maybe you know doing it doing it more efficiently or, or offering better deals or whatever. And, and, and if the destination marketing organisation website is no longer taking bookings, and if images about the destination are being presented on platforms outside the destination marketing organisation's website, then what's the purpose of the website? Mm -hmm. and, and how does that fit? How does it fit into that that framework? And again, these are just some of the things that are starting to, to, to bubble up as we look into this. And it, 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 you see it in other industries too. You know, um, like I was thinking about in terms of haul videos for the fashion industry. You know, independent bloggers who um, develop relationships with like makeup or uh, you know other yeah. types of, like fashion companies and receive the goods firsthand from them. Um, and if those items can be purchased through some sort of like larger aggregate like Amazon, then the independent website themselves that would have otherwise sold those goods, is it needed anymore, right? Yeah. Yeah. A connection between these more authentic representations of, you know, the average user's experience and then the larger distributor. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to see the sort of like systematic changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think, there's, I think there's, some, there's, there's some questions to be answered there, I think. And, yeah. and, and I think... Um, uh, I think, as I mentioned, it's 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 still early days yet in some respect. You know, and whilst some people are are um, engaging quite readily with with tourist imagery and, and and liking and sharing and building relationships, I think there's maybe still this question as to what's the because that's it's, it's maybe not it's maybe not a, a, a resource in terms of, of, of cost, but it's a it's a time resource to yeah. to do that and 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 what sort of gauging of return on investment on that time is taking place, if any, and, and is it a meaningful metric and, you know, what, what should we put in place, I guess, or if, you know, what, uh, uh, the, the, the financing of DMOs varies. It could be purely financed by the government. It may be a mix of government, a local authority, and, and membership fees from, from, from the hotels and the, the attractions. So ultimately, there's, there's going to be stakeholders potentially questioning How's my how's my membership fee being spent, and, and what's it doing to drive business to my to my business? And you know, I, I, I don't think it's been looked at at that level at the moment. 
yeah. could there come a time where it, where it is? So, um, Excellent. Again, well, yeah. it, this has been a really great case study and discussion with you. Um, you've given us a lot of uh, a lot to talk about, and I'm sure a lot to talk about in the future classes that we have together. Um, thank you so much for oh, taking the time. Um, we'll talk to you soon.